Thank you, everyone, for um, for really being staying engaged and being involved um, throughout these two days. Uh, I know this is a challenge to uh, maintain your attention. So what we'd like to do here is kind of walk through a very brief summary of what you know the key points that we've learned, uh, as well as some of the the next steps steps and action items. Again, this will be a very high level, brief, and totally incomplete um, overview. But what we're uh, planning to do is to is to send out a, a much more comprehensive summary of the meeting with action items and uh, specifics listed, and that we hope will be available within the next week or two. Um, I know Brittany and and um, uh, Hannah and Ida and Eric have all been uh, taking notes busily, as have uh, all of your co-chairs. So uh, this is a sort of compilation of thoughts from Jeff, Peter, um, myself, and really all of you um, from the the great discussions that have happened in the chat and, and elsewhere, uh, as well as all of the session chairs and, and presenters. Uh, just to remind you, one of the key goals of this meeting was to um, uh, have a charter ready for your review and, uh, and essentially ready for ratification. Uh, in that charter, which Mary De Silva and John Connolly uh, presented and developed masterfully, um, we have uh, uh, guiding principles laid out. Um, they are particularly important, I think, to uh, groups like ours that are heterogeneous in terms of the resources and um, uh, infrastructure that are available to them. Uh, uh, with principles of transparency, fairness, equity, and inclusivity. Uh, we intend for this to be a living document. These are guidelines rather than any kind of legal contract. So the groups who said they needed their legal departments to review this um, makes us a little bit nervous because it, it isn't intended to be a legal document. Um, there are uh, requirements, as it were, um, as sort of expectations more for collaboration and what, uh, what we will and won't do um, uh, with each other. Uh, a governance structure was, was laid out, um, types of membership. Uh, and in presenting that, there were no objections to it, um, which is great, and we're awaiting ratification. Um, we'll hear, I think, a, a little bit later or um, uh, from, uh, from the Secretariat in terms of exactly how we're going to go about that ratification, unless, Jeff or Eric, you'd like to comment on that now. Uh, I don't have a comment on the, on the process yet. We'll lay that out in some of the post-meeting notes. I just want to... You know, just on the charter uh, itself, I think um, it'll require a little bit restructuring of the um, of the IHCC's organization, and I think this is a real opportunity for inclusiveness. Uh, we would love to include more diverse, more and diverse um, member cohort members to be part of the governance. So I hope that we'll be, this will be an engagement process in addition to uh, one that gives us a more transparent uh, governance structure. Great, thank you. And uh, and as was pointed out, um, we will be uh, soliciting nominations and and then we'll hold some form of an election uh, for additional steering committee members so that we can uh, really have an uh, an eye on uh, increasing representation. So um, in terms of you know key kind of progress that was made um, and next steps from the policy and data sharing group. Uh, we had a publication policy uh, developed and presented. Uh, Laura and, and Good Peggy did, did fabulous work in, in bringing these forward. Um, and the, the key point of uh, as research proposals are made, um, we need to submit a publication plan with that so that everyone is, is aware um, really upfront and there are, are, uh, there's good communication around that. In discussing collaborations with industry, uh, we identified certain groups that we really would want to avoid uh, interacting with. There may be more or there may be specific ones in, in specific countries, but uh, there seemed to be agreement on at least the, uh, you know, the major vices, uh, tobacco, nicotine, alcohol would be things to avoid. Um, on data sharing principles, uh, Laura noted that we built on the GA4GH framework, and you heard GA4GH uh, mentioned a lot uh, today, um, but also uh, in, in other uh, times earlier. Um, and there, was, there were also responses from the cohort policy questionnaire that we've been trying to get our cohorts to answer for quite some time. Um, and we do ask that if you have not done that, um, please to complete it by June 5th, which is a month from now. It's a Friday. It may, it's an easy date to remember. Uh, and there will be instructions uh, forthcoming as to how you can do that. Uh, any additional comments on these policies? We realize they went by pretty fast. Uh, 
um, are needed by May 22nd. Uh, and we ask you to email those to Laura Rodriguez at the email shown here. Again, this will be in follow-up action items uh, with a final version to be distributed for uh, ratification. Again, with a process to be determined. Peter, did you, I saw you turned on your camera. Did you have something you wanted to comment on here or previously? No, Terry, I just wanted to be part of that, uh, uh, show that this was coming from all three of us as a, a real consensus of, of some very important work that we all believe needs to move forward. Absolutely. So thank you. And, and please jump in if I misstate or, or leave out something critical. Uh, Jeff, anything else? Just one quick thing, um, or two actually. One is, uh, since we do have a publication uh, policy now or something very close to it, it would be great if we had publications. Uh, so um, uh, there's, uh, there are, I know we don't, we don't have um, uh, a large amount of project-based work right now, but if people have ideas for publications that would eventually be projects or things that they think they would like to take the lead on right now, that, that would be wonderful. Um, and uh, Related to that, I think Laura made the point that um, this organization can actually be a, a great opportunity for junior investigators. So um, cohort leaders and other members, if you have people in your ranks that you think um, are uh, would hungry to be part of this and contribute, that's a wonderful thing. Great, thank you. Uh, in the data and IT infrastructure group, um, we saw a, a very impressive working prototype of the Atlas that we've all been eager to have since uh, even before we held our first meeting at Duke. Um, the search functions were, were quite robust and very flexible and uh, additional search functions can be added. Uh, and and the, the efforts in harmonization uh, were also quite impressive and were demonstrated to be working, although uh, a lot of manual uh, work is required for that. Hence the need for standardized measures if we can possibly get people to use them. Um, we could use some feedback on use cases for Atlas queries. So if there are additional queries that, uh, that you feel uh, would be useful to do and can describe kind of what that, uh, the scenarios are where those would be needed, um, the uh, data and IT group would be interested in hearing those. Again, uh, contact information uh, to be made available to you. Um, we uh, would like to further populate the Atlas with data from our IHCC cohorts, uh, as well as um, uh, some of the uh, uh, data dictionaries that we have, uh, and establish um, a compelling set of research and clinical uh, applications that can kind of be a showcase. So, so let's demonstrate, you know, how the Atlas uh, will, will address a given, um, a given research application. Um, sort of in relationship to COVID-19, uh, a strong desire to harmonize COVID-19 data dictionaries to the degree that they exist uh, currently within the cohorts or are being developed um, for discovery and analysis. And then adding um, phenotyping of COVID-19 cohorts, even if that's, you know, as, uh, you know, simple things as to whether, whether tests were positive, uh, whether hospitalization or deaths uh, uh, occurred. Um, and trying to add that information into the IHCC Atlas so that it's known uh, what data are available uh, in relation to the current pandemic. Okay, uh, from the scientific strategies group, um, we saw yesterday uh, the pilot polygenic risk score project uh, using four traits with federated data that not only um, uh, disseminated their, their scores, uh, got groups to calculate them, got the data back uh, and compiled and presented it uh, all in record time um, since uh, in the past couple of months or so. So that was very impressive. Um, the, the novel finding um, that uh, there was superior prediction with the trans-ethnic models was also um, somewhat surprising to some of us. Uh, and there's a paper in planning, which could be our, our flagship effort at running through our publication policy. So we would encourage uh, people to incorporate that, that framework. Um, and the group has suggested they'd like to launch three to five scientific initiatives for a year to year and a half time frame uh, using this federated data analysis approach, which we, we need to, to have given the, uh, the challenges in, in bringing data together. Um, we want to emphasize global diversity and go beyond uh, genomics or even omics and be sure to include uh, aspects of the environment uh, and other, other things that need to be considered. Um, and then, uh, as, as mentioned previously, trying to in integrate these project proposals into the overall governance framework. So as, as our governance framework develops, we need 
project proposals to populate it and to you know kind of kick the tires and see where it's where it works and where it doesn't where it may need a little bit of tweaking uh peter and jeff any comments on this just reinforcing that last point uh Terry, I, I, we've just got to stay flexible. And as we get these great flagship initiate use cases off the ground, these projects off the ground, uh, keep working them back in and learning from them and improving our governance framework as we go. So iterative process there. Great. Uh, Jeff, you're nodding. No, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, and I would say because we're, we're um, sensitive to everyone having been sitting for probably quite some time, uh, we're not allowing a lot of time for discussion in between slides, but would really ask if, if you have comments, please put them into the chat. Uh, we, will, we will capture all of those and, and do our best to address them. So, um, so please add them there. Uh, we had two very um, uh, stimulating sessions on COVID-19 research topics, uh, and many thanks again to uh, Kelly Jibo and, and Carrie Altoff for, for bringing us through those. Uh, at, the, um, at the second session today, those, those topics were refined a bit, and you can see in sort of darkish blue uh, italics additions from the group. So, so three areas that, that it seemed as though everybody was in, in quite a bit of agreement on in terms of scientific uh, research topics were um, the global expansion and timing of the, the COVID uh, epidemic, um, using not only serology, but, uh, but also looking at, at how social dis distancing and other mitigation efforts were put in place, testing uh, other things in, in the various countries and the cohort areas uh, to, uh, to have an impact on that. Uh, looking at the host genome and environmental exposures and relationship to COVID-19 manifestations, uh, not only sex differences, but uh, very importantly, were added uh, ethnicity, um, uh, comorbidity, and resilience, and, and really trying to, to identify some of those factors. The point was made that uh, resilience can sometimes, or, or uh, people who are resistant to infection can sometimes be uh, really strong indicators of, of uh, uh, therapeutic targets, as can heterogeneity between groups. Um, looking at environmental factors um, such as pollution, population density, public health infrastructure, et cetera, all of which differ considerably across the, the IHCC cohorts. Um, the role of biomarkers in COVID-19 outcomes and the, the potential for using uh, biomarkers as, as indicators of, of COVID um, exposure and, and infection. Uh, and then in the third area, the impact on mental health and anxiety, not only of the, the uh, uh, disease itself, but the, of the mitigation of public health efforts to uh, address it. During these discussions, we heard that um, a number of questions on the types of biospecimens that would be needed and agreed that a, a fourth uh, group on biospecimen standards or methods or you know, something related to, to biospecimens was needed. Um, and we would think that these would probably be the four areas that we would at least start working on in terms of, of working groups. And we do have some next steps on the next slide. So in terms of the next steps, um, a couple of people asked, gee, can we have the um, uh, cohort survey reopened? We, we may have missed it the first time around. Uh, and we will do that and let, let you know how that can be done um, in terms of your interest and the data that you have available on your cohort or would like to collect. Uh, we would like to identify and establish scientific working groups. And we're suggesting that there be one, at least to start, um, one sort of umbrella for each of these three topics and, and for the biospecimens group. And those may then you know, need to segment into subgroups as, as uh, uh, data accrue. And then um, Kelly and, and Carrie, recognizing the, uh, the immediacy of the epidemic, have asked that we sign up to participate by May 12th. Uh, again, the process, I may ask Eric and um, uh, others to, to comment, but the, uh, the process at present is just through an email to you, Eric. Is that correct, or is there something else? Yes, Terry. So for any burning or immediate uh, questions, uh, they can reach out to me directly. And I think my um, email address, if you don't already have it, is, is it will be within the slides during the break slides. Um, but we will be um, coordinating the, the signups much the way for those cohorts who were uh, participating in the Welcome Trust LMIC COVID questionnaire uh, working groups. Uh, and that process is we'll be communicating through a, a survey of interest um, in order for uh, interested cohorts to, um, to sign up to join a particular working group. Uh, those, those working groups will be self-managed. They'll self-select their own chairs um, and any um, uh, so steering group type representation. Uh, and then the secretary will be performing 
and providing uh, the program management and operational support functions uh, as we roll those out. Thank you. Uh, and I see there are some comments coming through in the in the chat as well about people interested in various groups. So that's another place where you can register your, your interest and we will capture that and get back to you. Um, we, we proceeded then um, in the, the later part of, of our second day to have some scientific presentations to dive a little bit more deeply on a, on a research uh, format um, on, in the, the, very, the, the three areas that we focused on most, uh, data standards and infrastructure being first. Uh, we heard about um, uh, from David Glazer about the, a, a cloud-centered approach, which is what the, you know, most of these data sets are moving to, uh, building on GA4GH standards and principles, which is Great. Um, and the Terra data platform, which will likely be made more available to uh, us and maybe something that the IHCC uh, decides to use uh, for storing its data that needs to be uh, determined. Um, we heard a lot about health and exposure data tools, which was terrific. Um, exposome measures and, and others that uh, are very challenging to collect, so it's good to, to know that those tools are available, um, as well as the Pandemic Vulnerability Index that I think um, sparked a lot of interest uh, among, the, uh, among the various groups and the listeners who were, who were there. So, um, other uh, points on this, Peter or Jeff? Yeah, um, just one thing. I, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, over the course of this meeting, um, a number of potential valuable resources have come to light that um, uh, in, in, in the back conversations I've been having with the IACC Secretariat is to develop um, effectively an IACC resource center uh, that would allow for the cohorts to have a, a one-stop shop for um, gaining access to some of these tools, such as the uh, PVI or uh, things that we saw, uh, different uh, questionnaires and so on and so forth. So, I hope that will be a useful um, function uh, for us to be able uh, to serve that up to the cohorts that are interested in accessing it in one place as opposed to uh, each of these um, groups maybe getting pinged by, um, you know, 97 different individuals. Great. Peter, anything else? Oh, okay. Next, please. Um, so in, in scientific strategy and cohort enhancement, we had several um, talks in, in that area um, the, from Alicia Martin, the very important point of, of the need to improve representation and equity in polygenic risk prediction. And it seems like IHCC can make a contribution to that, given our, our findings with the transethnic scores. Uh, she also made the very important point that uh, probably at this point we should invest most heavily in populations that are most different from distant from Europeans, since we're seeing that that gap um, uh, in representation of, of European and non-European data uh, widening. I, I would su suggest that part of that widening is due to the very large data sets, particularly UK Biobank, that are being analyzed multiple times. Uh, so it's the same 500,000 people, um, but obviously those are those are being analyzed and, and others are not. Um, the, we heard about the need for a truly global cohort uh, to, to attack Alzheimer's disease um, and, you know, drawing off uh, uh, people in the IHCC cohorts, identifying those who, who appear to have Alzheimer's phenotypes and phenotyping them more carefully, uh, using blood biomarkers, for, for example, um, rather than, you know, in lieu of or, or as a good surrogate for uh, genotyping or or uh, uh, gene sequencing. Uh, and there is the opportunity to um, uh, participate in some of the discussions that the uh, Alzheimer's collaboration is having by emailing Drew Holsenfeld. Uh, she had invited us to participate in, in two conference calls that they are having. And we also heard about the Phoenix Toolkit, the Phenotypes and Exposures Toolkit, um, that has standardized phenotype measures um, that are, are freely available. It, one or two of the questionnaires are, are uh, proprietary and, and may have some small licensing fees, but for the most part, they are freely and openly available uh, and would encourage people to use them uh, if they possibly can. So, uh, Peter and Jeff, anything to add there? Yeah, Terry, just on that last point on Phoenix, um, I think there were some questions after you and it presented about phenopackets and Phoenix. And I know that Lindsay Smith from the Clinical Phenotypic Working Group of GFGH is on the line. I don't know if Aaron still is, um, but I just think there's a real opportunity for us to have a conversation there and make sure that on the phenotypic standards, uh, we're collaborating. Great. Uh, and I would, would also note that, that there is a, uh, an intent to develop a joint 
um, IHCC uh, CEOI um, working group on, on Alzheimer's. That's the CEO initiative on, on Alzheimer's, which is the, the group that was presenting to us. So again, you'll hear more about that in coming days. Uh, just when, we, when we send out the, um, the, the information about the scientific working group so that this is um, envisioned to be a working group of the IACC and uh, the Davos Alzheimer's Collaboration, which is part of the CEOI that George and Elias and uh, Hakan and myself had discussed this. So uh, it seems like that's, if there's interest, uh, that group should be also stood up and move forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, next, please. And uh, there's, there's only three more slides left, so stay with me, guys. Um, so uh, in the policy and biodata sharing um, session, the, the scientific uh, talks covered the, uh, initially the international, uh, forgotten, it's not communicable, uh, disease alliance. Um, com common disease, thank you, how could I forget? Um, and it was reassuring to see that, uh, that they had very similar principles of collaboration. And, and in fact, uh, I think Jeremy Farrar made the point uh, later on that, that the scientific community really is coalescing around this kind of, of collaboration, uh, largely in response to, to COVID. But, uh, but the framework that was laid by GA4GH and other groups, um, such as ICDA and, and IHCC, are, are obviously uh, coming to the fore here. Um, I also noted the codes of conduct in the pan cancer effort uh, world, very similar to the guidelines that our policy group had developed. Um, and we, we heard also about the precision medicine portfolio of the World Economic Forum um, and I think uh, uh, conversations with IHCC leadership and the World Economic Forum are continuing. And then with our uh, uh, partners uh, on external engagement, um, we heard uh, again uh, about the GA4GH in, in more detail, um, providing the foundational principles and standards that uh, we are working very hard to use. And it's terrific to have Peter uh, as a you know one of, uh, a member of this triumvirate, so that we're sure that we're we're uh, harmonizing there. Uh, people are encouraged to join GA4GH uh, working groups, and we can, again, let, let you know uh, how to do that in follow-up. Uh, the Genomic Biodata uh, Consortium uh, was described as a coalition of critical global biodata resources uh, that ensure sustainability and free access to, uh, to global data. Um, this is something that would be obviously important for IHCC cohorts to be sure that we have a, a way of, of providing those data. Uh, this is, is still under development, but it's something that we want to continue to work with so that uh, the, our data, uh, as well as the data that are available in these resources, can be freely available. And then uh, we had a, a deeper dive into the International Common Disease Alliance, um, uh, looking at, at how our cohorts might contribute to this, this uh, rubric of moving from genetic maps and other kinds of uh, risk factor maps to mechanisms to actual uh, med uh, medicines. And, and we want to increase the exchange of data and applications in both ways. Um, so not, not only um, uh, things that can come from IHCC to help the ICDA efforts, but also uh, insights from, from those coming back into our cohorts. Um, and uh, those who have uh, data on COVID who are interested in contributing those data to the ICDA, uh, there was a, a, a URL provided um, that can, can help with that. Uh, Peter and Jeff, comments on this? Strange coming from me, Terry, but I, we'd add G2MC, of course, to this list. <laughs> and we sometimes yes. take it for granted because it's, it's so joined at the hip with IACC. But I think all of those who were either the global or the international uh, identity, um, constant challenge for all of us to be truly international or truly global. Uh, good news is that we're talking to each other, but I can see from a cohort perspective, where do I go, what do I join? If, I think if we, this collective group, including G2MC, do our work, we should be able to make it very clear where people's point of entry, where their highest value, how they don't have to join everything all the time, but they can join the piece that's most appropriate to them or the pieces, knowing that the rest of us will collaborate. And um, I've certainly talked to Teji and others about the need for us to do some kind of mapping for the community so you can see how these various initiatives align, where they're different, where they're distinct, but how critically important it is to work across them. So we should, we should take the responsibility for making this less confusing than it could otherwise be. 
Great. Thank uh, you. Completely Jeff. Agree. Um, I just wanted to, and I was going to say the same thing, so, but, you, but you said it probably more elegantly than I did, um, uh, that um, before ICDA uh, came to being, um, it was in incredibly instructive for uh, the G2MC, the GA4GH, and the GCB to GBC to get together leaders, as leaders to leaders and, and have these discussions that, and even develop a provisional map that would make it very clear or as clear as possible. Uh, you know why uh, these groups exist and why they're um, what they do for each other and what they do why they're distinct. So I think I'm just re-saying what you said, but I think that roadmap is going to be incredibly important for us as well as for the uh, communities we serve. Great, thank you. And then last last but not least, our our key action items. There will be a longer list. So next slide, please. Um, there will be a longer list of uh, of uh, the secretariat, so the membership doesn't have to be too worried about getting lots more things to do. Um, but things that we do have to do as a group are to ratify the charter. Um, uh, the process will be described and and sent out uh, very soon. Uh, similarly, nominating um, additional steering committee members, um, and that process will be defined. Um, Laura uh, Rodriguez has boldly asked for feedback on, on the policies to be emailed to her and has requested that by May 22nd. So if you could send that, any, any um, you know, the editing or questions or other kinds of things that you have on those policies. Uh, again, wordsmithing probably not needed, um, but if there's something that's, uh, that's major that needs to be um, addressed, please let her know. Um, you're asked to sign up for COVID um, uh, scientific working groups by May 12th. Uh, a, a more formal process can be provided, but Eric uh, will be willing to field those uh, emails if you if you are impelled to send one um, just as we finish today uh, and may not get back to it. Um, and if you wanted to join those Alzheimer call, uh, consortium calls on May 19th and 20th, we have Previously, these slides would be available. I'd shown you the, um, uh, the Hulsefeld um, email for that. Um, there will be minutes and more detailed action items to come, and I'll ask Jeff to comment on, on future plans, but we were sort of batting around the idea of, given that this, this reform meeting seems to have uh, gone quite well, at least to us, um, that perhaps we should schedule a similar um, meeting of this group in the fall. Um, and uh, one of the key things we need to keep in mind is the need to develop a five-year roadmap for, for the program. When we heard earlier that maybe five years is too short, right now it seems pretty long, um, but, but having a, a longer-term plan for the, for the consortium is, is critical to our sustainability and, and our success. Uh, Jeff, do you want to comment on those? Uh, sure. So um, first, I was just reflecting on the feeling um, that uh, we had leaving Reykjavik a year ago uh, we were um, still not quite a consortium um, in spirit, but more in name. And I would say that um, this meeting, I, I think, has really galvanized us in the way it was intended. Uh, the feedback I've gotten, we've, we've all gotten, is that this has been a successful format to uh, get together. And I do feel like uh, we, we truly are a consortium now, than, um, more so than we were before in spirit. Uh, so... Um, to keep that alive and keep the momentum going. I think a year is far too long for us to get together as a community. Um, we have now more work to do than we had um, going into this meeting, and it's going to be, I think, rather important for us to take uh, some um, check-ins along the way as a, as a community while the work streams are going on in parallel. So this idea of having a one-day meeting like this one in the fall, I think uh, unless there's significant pushback, is something that we absolutely should do to make sure that we're um, continuing to be uh, on track. Um, so, so yes, I would fully endorse that the five-year road map or five-year planning was actually a deliverable that we articulated we would put into the request for funding to the Welcome Trust. And I'm sure the NIH would be also quite interested in that as well. So um, it's a deliverable um, that we have to organize ourselves around. And I think we've got a lot of great substrate, no question. And we've got the right people, no question. So uh, that's something that will probably feed into this virtual uh, working meeting as well as some of the other work streams. Great. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And I, I think we, we do need to end. It's 1.31. Um, Peter, any, any closing words? Thanks, Terry. Just one thing we missed in this summary, because it, it literally was the last session, uh, was the industry engagement. And I'm, it reminded me as we pull that group in, 
uh, the, the, you know, people have often use the proverb to talk about the difference between going fast and going far. And I think in this case with IHCC, we've got an opportunity to both go fast and go far uh, and to go in places that we otherwise would not be able to reach, but only if we manage to engage cohorts in all countries, cohorts of all uh, types, and also uh, the full spectrum of people who can contribute to this. And that includes funders, it includes cohort leadership, and it includes industry. So my pitch is just for this inclusive community that could actually deliver on this, uh, take us both fast and far. Great, thank you very much. So with that, I think uh, we can conclude. Thank you all again for your, your dedicated attention um, through these past two days. And um, um, that's it. Yeah, I just make one quick. Uh, uh, please, sorry. Uh, really, uh, first I want to thank Peter and Terry for your, uh, your uh, amazing roles as co-chairs of this consortium. But also I want to go back and rem remind people that this couldn't have happened if it weren't for Hannah and Eric and Ida and Meredith and Teji and Chip and John and Brittany have all done an amazing job to pull this off in the last few weeks to make this meeting possible. So we're um, grateful to uh, our team. Amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.